So welcome to our uh, lecture on music colonialism and Orientalism. This is kind of a two-part lecture. The first will be now, and then this kind of revisiting Orientalism uh, will happen later on in the semester. We'll kind of look at more contemporary examples of music and Orientalism and exoticism. Um, today we're going to talk about um, a little bit of the colonial project that happened in the um, 16, 17, 1800s and discuss some of the musical markers and kind of artistic markers of exoticism and the concept of the kind of the capital O other. This is just a short gif about uh, the, uh, how colonial expansion operated um, from really the 1400s through the uh, 20th century. It's a it's not the greatest in terms of its detail, but it's a quick quick um, uh, explanation of how it works. But if we watch from the beginning here, 1492 is really when America is discovered, and then at, at, from that point on, the European powers really expand across the globe and uh, consolidate their power across most of, of, the, of, the, of the world. And this, um, again, after the First World War, starts to dissipate. And then by the time we reach the 2000s, most um, nations have given up their, their colonial power, uh, their colonial territories. One of the kind of main things uh, that as European powers expanded across the globe, what they try to do is impose order on what they thought was kind of a disordered world. And so as your reading mentioned, the one by Tim Taylor on exoticism and opera, uh, one of the, thing, the first things they did was to try to impose kind of a, a chronology, a single chronology across the world that was an attempt to kind of subsume all local histories into kind of the one grand history. And part of what they did was kind of impose this Gregorian calendar or the kind of European way of counting time uh, in uh, throughout their territories. And so um, we really nowadays, we the whole world operates off of the Gregorian European uh, Western calendar. So it's now 2018. Um, but when Europe encountered people in the Islamic world, people in the um, Chinese world, in the in the Hindu world, in, in Africa, etc., all these places had different types of uh, ways of keeping track of time and different histories. And that all got really subsumed into the kind of colonial project. And so I have a few examples here of, you know, the Chinese lunar calendar, the Islamic lunar calendar, and the the Hindu lunar calendar, and these are all different ways of keeping track of time and different ways of recording history, and they were all subsumed in this colonial project into kind of the one Gregorian way of counting, uh, counting time. Not only was uh, counting time and kind of creating history um, or one history uh, part of the colonial project, but really um, an important kind of way of thinking about the world was about how people were ranked on uh, civilization. So even before Darwin came about with his theories of evolution and then kind of the social evolution uh, ideas came, that came after Dar Darwin, people in Europe were um, trying to figure out uh, how to understand other cultures and other people. And so one of the popular ways of, of understanding kind of where people fit in the grand scheme of things was kind of um, uh, putting people on this pyramid. So um, showing that modern Europeans, in the, this is again in the 17, 1800s, uh, modern Europeans were kind of the pinnacle of progress. And as you move down that pyramid, then you get to different stages of kind of uh, civilization. So you're going to get, um, as you move down from the you know, purported pinnacle of modern progress, which is Europeans, you get down to different levels of um, um, savagery and different levels of organized religion, etc., until you get down to kind of the most most basic people who are kind of the, the wild men of the days, or as you see in this this category, um, Italians didn't even rank up with um, modern Europeans. Um, but as you move down the civilization pyramid, you go from civilization to barbarism to savagery, uh, etc. So this is a very popular model um, conceived by this one is actually conceived by E. B. Tyler. But even before that, um, as you read in your reading. Um, civilization was this kind of something to be um, climb up and something to be ranked on as Europeans encountered all these different peoples across the world and attempted to kind of put them in their place. Also one thing important from, from the reading is the 
the idea that commercial consumerism or the consumption of English and European goods was a marker of your status or your your, your kind of attainment in, in as a civilized society. It was also a way to um, progress through that pyramid of civilization. So uh, it, was, it was thought that if you were um, an African from Africa, if you were living as a Europe, uh, Englishman and you had your uh, Englishman habits, etc., cetera, um, you were progressing on that, that, that pyramid of civilization. And so really consumption of commercial goods was considered not only a marker of your taste, it was a marker, uh, or taste was really a marker of pedigree, of your morality and your, your attainment. And we're moving on to the idea of Europe um, encountering the other, the kind of capital O other. And one of the first encounters Europeans had was with kind of the Islamic world and North Africa and the Middle East uh, and the kind of Ottoman Empire, um, which was really right at the doorstep of Europe very early on. And it kind of came to occupy this special place in the European imagination, um, the Ottoman Turks and Turkish things and Tur Turkish music, as we'll talk about in a second, um, really became the rage um, throughout Europe because of its proximity. So um, we'll talk about kind of the Middle East and uh, farther east from, from Europe in a second. But really, um, throughout the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance, um, Western Europe quite reasonably feared kind of this really powerful Ottoman Empire for both um, military reasons. It was one of the most powerful empires in the world um, and also for kind of its difference in culture and religion. Um, in 1529, the Ottoman Empire attempted and failed to take Vienna and um, really kind of this this failure was is kind of the signal of the beginning of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, but really the Ottoman Empire stuck around until um, the, you know, the First World War. Um, but by the time around of Mozart and these kind of composers we'll talk about in a second, um, the Ottoman Empire wasn't really uh, a threat, but it occupied this large space in European imagination. It was, um, it was still the Ottomans and the kind of Turks were still seen as these, these frightening populace almost on a mythological level, even though they weren't any real serious military or political threat to Europe. Um, the Ottoman Empire and all things Turkish, um, and I put Turkish in, in kind of air quotes, um, was, was a really important um, way that Europe understood itself and also understood the, the other or the kind of the East. And so, um, for the people of Western Europe, uh, all things, again, Turkish, uh, their dress, their customs, their food, etc., cetera, um, really became a, a serious fascination for Europe um, in, this, in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, Turkish dramas and ballets and operas, um, as well as like hints of, of kind of exotic music, really um, were, were, were taken up by composers like uh, Jean-Baptiste Lully, um, Franck, Rameau, Gluck, uh, Haydn, um, you know, and as we as we heard in your required listening, Mozart, etc. So it was kind of a very vogue thing to use exotic sounds or um, you know what was a, what people thought was a symbol of the kind of the Turkish exoticism. Um, uh, so Europeans' perceived rival, which was the Ottoman Empire, was at its doorstep, even though it wasn't really its rival uh, in the 17th, 18th century so much. Um, but the Janissaries, these kind of Turkish military uh, men, really became an object of fascination and fear and parody. And they were oftentimes Janissaries or Janissary type music was, was placed in uh, European opera and European um, orchestral pieces um, as kind of this exotic other sound. Um, as as the, the, some of the kind of markers of Turkish sounds were these the use of symbols, of bass drums, triangles and tambourines and other things that would kind of symbolize this the exotic other. Um, and I put Turkish on your screen uh, in quotations because really Turkish at, at, during the, the 18th century really was kind of a catch-all for any type of exotic sound. Um, so you could have kind of Turkish quote-unquote sounding symbols and bass drums, and it would be sometimes paired with even, you know, farther east, uh, the Orient, farther east. And so it was this catch-all for any really exotic music. Um, and 
the Turkish band actually did have a, a kind of a, a big influence. Um, this kind of marching band type music that we have nowadays really has roots in the kind of the way the um, Turkish Janissaries would um, perform music during their during their battles. So in in the Ottoman battles, these Turkish music musicians, these Janissaries would would um, perform in a semicircle around the Turk the Ottoman flag, um, and it was assumed that everyone within hearing distance of that flag, that as long as they could hear the music being played, this kind of loud um, marching band type music, um, they could they would know that the, the Ottoman uh, flag was unharmed and they could still continue the battle. And this was, this kind of military type music really had an influence on the West and really is the kind of progenitor of uh, military bands in the West that we have today. And especially the kind of, um, the the wind ensemble bands we have even in high schools and stuff like that really have their roots uh, in these Ottoman Janissary type music that would developed in the um, that developed first in the in the in the kind of Ottoman Empire and then were kind of picked up by European powers like the Polish military in the 1700s etc and so the, the Turkish sound was not only a, a sound that was used by Western composers to it, it was inserted into their music as this kind of exotic sound, but the kind of the Ottoman military band sound really was the influence and progenitor for the um, Western military band and, and, um, and wind ensembles we have nowadays. So that w not only in addition to these instruments, we have um, kind of the cymbals, bass drum, etc., that you could hear in compositions, you're gonna have many different codes of of essential difference and essential meaning kind of these essentialized traits. And so some of these codes of difference you're going to hear and we'll, we'll discuss in the coming examples and we'll also discuss later on in, uh, in um, different lectures. But really if you have modes or harmonies that are different from the normal major or minor, this is a kind of code of musical difference. If you have chromaticism, a lot of chromaticism or extended dissonance. Again, this is a code signify, you know, put in there by composers to signify something exotic or different. Um, again, bare textures, unisons or parallel octaves, fourths or fifths are all, were also used by many, many composers to kind of signify the East, the Orient or, or, or something exotic. Um, if you recall your kind of basic music theory in Western um, composition really you want to avoid parallel octaves and fourths and fifths and so inserting these was a very obvious audible, you know, audible marker of, of difference. Um, the fourth code of, of difference would be distinctive repeated um, rhythmic or melodic patterns and we'll see that um, in a in later slides examples um, but if you have a kind of repeated um, kind of a tom-tom beating drum or a repeated melodic riff that would go over and over and over and over kind of beyond the normal um, what would be considered normal or appropriate in Western uh, compositions. That was, again, another code of musical difference. Asymmetrical st phrase structures, um, again, unusual instruments or kind of quote, quote, Turkish instruments in terms of cymbals or bass drum. And then also the distinctive vocal ranges like a throbbing vibrato or a really low mezzo soprano sound or no vibrato at all. These are all ways that European composers in the 17th, 18th uh, centuries would kind of introduce these exotic uh, and sometimes imagined um, ele elements into their music. Um, one thing I'd ask you, seeing these codes of difference, what, do, what does this leave uh, for the kind of domain of quote unquote essential Western music? So if, if chromaticism in the 17th, 18th centuries was a, as a code of difference, obviously, you know, um, uh, functional harmony would be a code of essential Westernness, right? Um, or um, kind of normal major and minor, or um, like normal rhythmic patterns instead of kind of this repeated rhythmic patterns. Um, all these things. So one thing to keep in, keep in mind is when you see these codes of difference, there's the flip side of that. There's the kind of essential codes of Westernness that you have to think of as well. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit throughout this lecture. So you had one uh, listening example. It was assigned for you to listen to, and I'll play. I want you to um, go pause the video and listen to again to the to Mozart's the abduction from the Seraglio, which is um, kind of the, his his um, interpretation of Turkish.
um, elements and Turkish um, themes in his operas. As you can see a few pictures here on your screen, it's very um, stereotypically Middle East um, dancing harem girls and kind of the, the pashas and all these kind of um, stereotypes that would come along with this exoticization of music. But again, listen to um, the, the Janissary Chorus by Mozart and then try to identify some of the elements we just talked about. So instruments, um, you know, distinctive vocal ranges, um, uh, again, all these di all those different categories of musical difference. See if you can come with some of those. And there's also I gave you another example of an earlier composer that you can listen to as well. This is Jean Baptiste Lully, again a very famous composer, um, 1632 to 1687, so before Mozart by quite a bit of time. But he has some of the same sort of um, musical codes of difference that he puts into his music to make it exotic. So he, the example I've, I've posted for you is the March pour la ceremonie des Turcs, so the March for the Ceremony of the Turks. And um, so I, I encourage you both to, to listen to both of those and try to identify some of the musical codes of difference we just discussed. So hopefully you were able to listen to the Mozart and the Lully examples and really once you kind of have those codes of difference lined up for you. It's very easy to hear the exotic sound that these composers were attempting to um, pass off. Um, I thought I'd give you one kind of um, one or actually I'll give you two uh, more modern examples of the kind of the exotic sound in music. And so the first um, there's two examples and both this is the Dave Brubeck Quartet and this is in the 19, late 1950s and this is Blue Rondo a la Turk and this is a super famous jazz standard and I want you to listen to it um, listen to the first example for sure the second example is just kind of a the same piece of music but with more orientalist um, imagery but listen to that example and then pause this video come back and I'll discuss a little bit of the elements that you heard So I think it's a, a great piece of music. Um, if you could hear the time signature in the beginning, the da 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 so it's one two one two one two three one two one two. So it's a nine eight pattern with a two plus two plus two plus three. Um, so is that right? Two four six yeah two 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 three. So nine eight pattern, and then that intermingles with a kind of a four four swing pattern. So if you could hear that, um, what that is is really it's it's. Dave Brubeck kind of consciously riffing on the idea of kind of an exotic time signature, this this 9-8, and he's switching it up with a kind of almost dramatically juxtaposing it with a 4-4 swing. Um, so Brubeck is on the piano, um, Paul Desmond is on the, on the alto sax, and it's really, I think it's a really fun piece of music. So there's an example from the kind of the lounge atmosphere, which is fun to watch. If you watch the next uh, example, it's the same piece of music, like I said, but Dave Brubeck and his band are now floating on a magic carpet over the freeways of Los Angeles. And I think that's just a, a really great example of kind of um, the, not only the exoticization, exoticization of the music, this Turkish music, um, or quote unquote Turkish music, but also the kind of putting in these images like the flying carpet and all these stereotypical images we have of the East. Um, this kind of combination of those two exoticizations in the, in the second Dave Brubeck video. I also want to talk about the idea of quote unquote primitives or the ideas of the savage, of the noble or the other type of savages really. But uh, this, has, this had a huge uh, impact on artists, on thinkers and on, on really society in terms of how people, um, how Europeans understood the other and how in, in uh, you know, as, as a negative uh, understanding of themselves. And so the idea of the noble savage or a man that has been uncorrupted by civilization or a person that's more in tune or closer with nature or the natural state of humankind has been around really for centuries. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote in the uh, 1700s, is commonly credited for advancing this idea that people were more noble in their primitive state, although Rousseau didn't actually um, say this um, outright, really. It was an idea that came before him. Um, there was a, a contrasting idea that, that primitives were savage. They were, you know, um, the Thomas Hobbes, kind of the Englishman author of the Leviathan, wrote in the 1600s, really, that kind of the, the primitive state was, uh, was um, brutish, unjust, ugly, and violent, really. Um, and that 
that it was not something we wanted to return to, but so we had to kind of advance in civilization towards a higher and, and better state. His famous quote is that the um, a state of in constant war or the state the primitives lives in lives in are there's it's solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, but the idea of uh, the primitive or the savage really uh, made its way into a lot of music in the 16, 17, and 1800s. Um, uh, like the Turkish musical exoticism, the so-called primitive was ascribed many musical characteristics that you'll hear, like the use of drums or no real melody, kind of the simple chanting, uh, wild dances, etc. And this, these were inserted into operas or were the subject of many operas and, and plays and, and music. Um, in the 17, 18, or 16, 17, 1800s. Um, so the, the exotic other, kind of the exoticization in music really began to encompass pretty much all non-Western figures in the European imagination. So you had these so-called Turks, you had savages you know, from, from the Americas, you had Muslims and those from the Far East. Basically, what they became is were, were they were all mostly, or and also people from from Africa. Um, they were all lumped together um, as kind of this non-European other. Um, they became the other to the European sense of self. And like I said, this happened over time. This wasn't some kind of immediate. Um, uh, it wasn't immediately crystal crystallized in in European minds, uh, but it happened over time. If you can think of. Uh, back to Shakespeare, even to Othello, uh, he's the, the the more he's the other. He's the person. He's the black man who is not um, who is kind of out of place, right? So it's been going on from Shakespeare even m long before Shakespeare, and gone through for many centuries. This kind of the establishment of the other in contrast to the European self. Um, it accelerated in the. 16, 7, or, you know, 15, 16, 1700s, really because of colonialization. As Europeans expanded throughout the globe, they were directly in confrontation and or uh, negotiation and confrontation with these um, figures. And a lot of what was reported back to the European nations was um, uh, some fact and a lot of imagination. So the process, the kind of colonial expansion that began in the 1400s and really continued through the 20th century um, was a process of Europe encountering others, making stories about others, recording their music about, about the others, and, and kind of the process of how the other became such a, uh, a pivotal thing in European imagination. So I gave you um, one uh, uh, example of this kind of the use of, of primitives or, or savages, as um, they were called, so-called savages, uh, in your required listening. And I thought if you hadn't listened to it yet, or if you want to listen to it again, it'd be really great to uh, attempt to kind of identify some of the markers of primitivism or exoticism. So this is an, the example I gave you was from Jean-Philippe Rameau's um, Les Indies Galantes, which is the Amorous Indians. And I gave you um, the Amorous Indies, I guess. The, uh, I gave you the last act of the, of the, the opera, which is um, The Savages, which is kind of uh, based on or kind of Rameau's imagination of the American Indian. And so go again, watch this, watch the video again, and really listen for those markers of, of difference. The sonic markers of difference and look for the visual markers of difference. I think this is a, it's really great music, um, but it really is an interesting example of the exoticization of, um, or use of, of so-called primitive elements in, in Western opera. Um, just as a, as a, um, as an, an aside, the, the, um, the Amorous Indies, uh, is, was basically, it was interesting because each act is, has a different, um, exotic, uh, person. So the first act is the generous Turk, you know, the second act is the Incas of Peru. The third act is about, it's called the flowers, but it's actually about these kind of, it's, it's set in Persia. And the fourth act is again, the savages set in, in, uh, Rameau's imagined, imagined America, um, with the native Americans. And so I, I think this is a great example of how you can see how Europeans really lumped all these different peoples from across the world into that big 
capital O other, and it made perfect sense because they were um, they're all representative of the other or the exotic or the the orient, um, even though they're in totally different parts of the world. So again, watch the video and then um, pause this pause this lecture, watch the video again, and really listen for those musical markers of difference and and try to enjoy some of the uh, the acting and the music as well. So having looked at the um, markers of kind of musical exoticization from uh, from Rameau through Mozart, um, before Mozart, Lully, uh, it was really a popular thing to do for most composers in the 16, 17, 1800s in Europe. Um, I thought we should look at the idea of Orientalism. And this is a concept really put forward by Edward Said in a famous 1978 book called Orientalism. And rather than having you read the first uh, 90 some odd pages like I normally do with most of my classes. I'll have you just watch. I signed the, the video where he discusses Orientalism. Um, I hope you watch the entire thing, uh, but if you haven't, rewatch the first 10 minutes and 35 seconds, really, the kind of up until the section on American Orientalism, and look at, um, uh, try to understand some of the concepts he's talking about in terms of how Europe. Uh, uh, came to imagine imagine the Orient. So if you pause this lecture, watch the um, required uh, viewing for at least the 10 minutes and 35 seconds, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss Oriental Orientalism a little bit more and how uh, it's, a, it's a powerful concept to understand how the West has interacted with the East or the Orient um, for several hundred years and really continues to do so. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we'll have a, a, another lecture on Orientalism and contemporary, like today. Um, but right now, I want to kind of focus on the earlier, um, earlier encounter with Europe with with the East. So pause the video, watch Orientalism for 10 minutes and 35 seconds, and come back. So I think it's a, a very good video. It's a, it, it encapsulates a lot of his writing. Um, but what I want to add, I want to add a few more things that may um, that are kind of implicit in, in Said's discussion of Orientalism. Um, Orientalism really is, he talks about it in, Said talks about Orientalism in three ways. The first way is that Orientalism is a profession or a realm of academic study. And really this was in the past, many scholars approached the study of the Orient, everything from uh, North Africa, you know, you know, just below Spain, all the way over to East China. Um, they, uh, scholars and academics um, earlier on, not necessarily nowadays, but there are still remnants of this today, but earlier on academics really um, looked at this area of study as the Orient, and they called themselves Orientalists, and these Orientalists were part of many academic subdisciplines, their art, their history, their languages, quite often there were languages, but they all treated the Orient really as a kind of a, a, a gigantic place uh, filled with, um, that was appropriate to study as, as a place, even though the Orient, uh, as Said mentions, is really a fiction. Um, there's no thing called the Orient. And then if you look with any kind of uh, fine-grained observation, uh, all the cultures and, and music and art and um, societies that are subsumed in this idea of the Orient are so radically different. It seems preposterous. You can really call it, you can imagine it as one thing, but it was done uh, by many people. So um, really the earlier academics and scholars looked toward to the Orient to understand not only the, the you know, the Orient and the cultures in it it's themselves, but also they oftentimes looked to the Orient and tried to understand how it may have been, um, or how it may, how Western civilization may have grown out of uh, different older civilizations in the Orient, or how even how to study how society developed from less advanced or developed stages into the kind of modern Western pinnacle of of, of European progress, really. Um, so. Uh, the first category of what Orientalism is or was uh, is a profession or a realm of academic study. Uh, you would be called an Orientalist. The the second category is um, I wrote up his his Said's word here is a style of thought based on an ontological and an epistemological distinction between the Orient and the Occident. And really, what this is 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 it, it's. The definition of Orientalism, is, the second definition, is expressing an imaginary divide between the categories of Orient and Occident, Occident meaning the West. 
um, that these are two cultural and social constructs, con constructs that are really opposite. Uh, they, they are in, in basically every way, the Orient is the opposite of the Occident. And this is, again, like I said, kind of an imagined, um, uh, it's an imagined thing we can see nowadays, especially after Said's writing, but before this was a very powerful way of, uh, that, that Europe used to understand the, the others. Um, and in many respects, uh, this kind of, the idea of the, of the Orient having many of these, these similar qualities was picked up by people in the, in these, uh, cultures in, um, from the Middle East on, on East and was sometimes used by them, by their own cultures themselves, kind of reaffirming some of the stereotypes that, um, that came out of Western contact with the East. Um, the West and the East, or sometimes termed the West and the rest, they're seen as fundamentally different. They possess different qualities. They're different peoples, different traditions. And the mix or cross over these two West and East seems almost impossible because these are fundamental qualities. These are essential qualities of the people. And so Orientalism is a style of thought based on this distinction between Orient and Occident. And the final way that uh, the final definition of Orientalism really that is important to understand is that it's a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient um, through academic publications. Uh, so let's recall the video you just watched, how Saeed talked about when Napoleon conquered Egypt, the first people who sent in really were scientists to uh, or ethnographers to just to document and inscribe all the features of Egypt and the Orient as part of their project of kind of domination and of, of rule. So um, Orientalism is a way to institutionally assert dominance over the East by um, settling the physical space, by putting col you know, colonies there, by teaching facts about the Orient in schools, by making authorized statements by, um, by the government about the Orient, by ruling over it, and by restructuring it. So the West restructured what they considered the Orient in pretty monumental ways. I mean, just for example, think very simply about how uh, European powers divided up, really divided up the world uh, into, national, into national boundaries. So it was really restructuring Africa, uh, the Middle East and the East. Um, Western powers did this in a, in a pretty, pretty dramatic way. Um, so the, um, all three of these definitions of Orientalism are important for understanding how the West interacted, how European powers interacted with the rest of the world. Um, the, some, like the first definition of a profession or academic study, are not quite as, as common nowadays, but each three definitions of Orientalism have absolute importance uh, today, and they certainly did um, during the times we're talking about the 16, 17, 1800s. Um, and we'll go into some of those different features in terms of music in the next slide. So as, as Saeed mentioned in the video, there are many uh, essentialist ideas about what the Orient is, or what the East is, or what, what kind of the people uh, express, the, the Oriental people express. Um, so there's essentialist tropes of Orientalism that I've listed here, that the Orient is feminine or effeminate somehow, or the men are effeminate. It's, it's sexualized in, the, in European views. Um, for our purposes, the idea that the Orient is timeless and unchanging will play into a lot of ideas a lot of concepts about rhythm that we'll discuss in a second. Um, the Orient is irrational, it's emotional, it's dangerous, it's mystical, it's languid. Uh, all these tropes of Orientalism you're going to see over and over and over um, in the examples I'm giving you today and the tropes you're going to see throughout uh, the 20th century and in our, our, our lecture later on. Um, the Orient is, is uh, all the countries, all the cultures in there are considered ineffectual and yet somehow um, dangerous at the same time. All these concepts like this um, are really persistent and they persist through different art forms. Um, they persist through uh, writing, painting, music, film, all these things we're going to see over and over again. And so it's important when you see these types of portrayals of the East to recognize it's not just... Um, uh, it's not innocent in a way. It's, uh, it comes from a long history of Western um, modes of thinking about the East. And I think once you recognize that, you can, uh, it really helps you your analysis of, of what you're viewing and or hearing.
so here's some just you know really um, I think they're beautiful paintings but there's a style of orientalist painting that you're gonna see over and over um, as you can see in many of these examples on your screen one of the major obsessions with the Orient was the kind of sexuality of the women and the dangerousness of the men um, and this these are, again are orientalist tropes that really um, happened over and over and over um, one of the major obsessions of travel writers for um, to to the Middle East, to India, etc., was the kind of sexuality of the women, um, and this was really um, this this obsession with Eastern women's sexuality was really influenced by the, the the debates going on in Europe about the virtue or vice of women, and so as Said said, the language used by Europeans to describe the Orient. Um, in trying to control cultures it found difficult to understand. Uh, they sexualized the Orient by putting in it in a subordinate feminine position, feminine position. Um, but at the same time, it was, it was simultaneously seductive and mysterious and promising. And so Oriental women really became a matter of obsession and, an, and also an identity crisis for European travel writers and for Europeans back home reading these travelogues. And so the, um, the Oriental woman's presence in the harem hidden from European gaze um, really subverted the traditional uh, male dominant position. Um, and so as, as a European to observe the in, uh, you know, Oriental woman, um, the Europeans really kind of understood the East or imagined the East uh, imagined itself imagined the Europeans imagined themselves through the East so they formulated their own identity European identity as uh, rational as um, sexually repressed even though you wouldn't call it that way but not certainly not as as free as the you know harem girls would be come to imagine but Europe really imagined and formulated its identity in contrast to the the imaginary essentialist tropes that they had formulated for uh, for the Orient so I wanted to shift over and talk about Orientalism and music and some of the um, ways that Europe Europeans encountered the music of the other and um, the kind of problems they ran into in trying to understand the aesthetics and kind of integrate the music of the um, other peoples into their conception of what music was. So I'm going to give you an example, a few examples here um, from India. And while Said talks about the Orient and Orientalism really is focused on the Middle East, he goes, it does talk about it in its relationship to India and the Far East. And um, so there's some examples here that I'm going to give you. Um, the first is in the late 1700s, um, a book was comp compiled by the name of the Oriental Miscellany, and it was basically a book of um, um, Indian or Hindustani music uh, that was transcribed or um, translated, I guess, into uh, music for the harpsichord. Um, it was written by a name, man named William Hamilton Bird, and one of the chief problems he ran into in 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 transcribing these Indian airs, as he called them, onto the page into Western notation and for the harpsichord is that he noted that the irregular rhythms of Indian music cost him, quote, great pains to bring them into any form as to time. Um, so going back to those kind of tropes of Orientalist, you know, essential Orientalism, Orientalist thought, um, that that idea of timelessness, of, of a place out of time and without time and unchanging, um, in, in some ways it also plays over into the idea of rhythm and how uh, Europeans had a very difficult time understanding uh, the rhythmic modes that were used in Indian music, in Arab music, uh, and it was very perplexing to them. Uh, another thing that um, was really challenging for Europeans in encountering music in the Middle East and in India, etc., was uh, the lack of harmony. And so what you'll find in, in the next few examples is that uh, English and Europeans would hear tunes from other cultures and they would oftentimes add try to add harmony to make it fit their conception of what good music was and so kind of the greatest imperfection that William Byrd noted was the lack of harmony and what he did is basically add thirds and fifths uh, to make it more palpable to the 
uh, or palatable to the, the Western ear. Um, Europeans encountered the East. Uh, they weren't always uh, negatively Orientalist or, or their encounters were not always fraught with such kind of a moral and artistic violence as we kind of may imagine. Uh, in some instances they were, um, but really you have to kind of step back also and maybe place yourself in their shoes. So you have these European colonists or, or travelers headed to the East, headed to the Arab world, headed to the Islamic world or headed to India, kind of the Hindu Islamic mixture you have there or even farther. And a lot of scholars and travelers really did the best they could to understand and interpret the music they heard. Um, they, were, they were they had a certain set of European aesthetics and experience that they had to draw from, uh, and it was, that was limited. Um, and because this is before recordings, especially, there was a very limited understanding of the, the kind of variety and uh, um, di difference there was in music of the East. So I'll now turn to uh, one um, person specifically, and we'll explore some of the examples. Uh, that she had transcribed. This is Sophia Plowden, and she was an amateur musicologist. She was the wife of a colonial um, authority in India. And like William Hamilton Bird and other musicologists like Margaret and Joseph Fox and others, they spent a lot of time in India interacting with musicians. They interacted with kind of the royalty, the courts in different courts in India, and they lived their lives in these kind of colonial um, settings as well. But in the 1700s, late 1700s, 1780s, uh, Plowden wrote down many songs that she heard that she had heard from. Uh, dancing girls, dancing women, or notch girls, used to call them, and courtesans, who were really kind of a, the pinnacle of kind of music and culture, um, uh, like high culture in, in the Indian uh, style. So um, what she did is what she heard these Hindustani airs, and she transcribed them for the harpsichord. And in doing so, she was transcribing them and translating them into kind of a European format. So she would add time signatures, she would add a bass line, she would add some some sense of harmony, etc. And really this was taking an Indian tune that would normally have been melody and, and rhythm, or melody drone and rhythm, and adding kind of some European aesthetics to it. Um, these transcriptions and interpretations of kind of Indian or Oriental melodies were really popular in Europe. Um, it's said that many of the famous European composers own copies of the Oriental Miscellany and based kind of some of their knowledge about um, their kind of imagination of what the East was like on this these, this book, the Oriental Miscellany. Um, Plowden and others were awarded honors by the Indian authorities and royalty for their really genuine engagement and, and interest in Indian music and for their attempt to kind of bridge this musical cultural divide. And so um, while a lot of what I've been talking about in this lecture have been kind of the challenges and difficulties of Orientalism and exoticism in music, um, this is an example, a, a good example of people who are genuinely engaged and really interested in learning about the culture. Um, and they're also bound by their time, their aesthetics, and how they understand the world. Um, so this this first example I'll play for you is an example from the Oriental Miscellany. This is a, a tune written down um, by Sophia Plowden that was um, transcribed into kind of a, a harpsichord format. And this is a, a song called um, Mutrabi uh, Kwashnawa Bego, which is Sing Sweet Tongue Musician. And it's a poem, a, a ghazal, which is a type of poem um, written by the famous poet Hafiz, and it's in Persian. Uh, and this is what she heard this poem and then translated into this, this example of um, harpsichord music. So I'll play that for you and we'll discuss a little bit about what, you, what you've heard. So you heard um, a nice, the first few measures were actually um, kind of a drone on the bass, bass hand, left hand of the, of the harpsichord with a melody going over top. 
And you heard that melody basically repeated several times with a little bit more elaboration on top of it. And that's something you would have heard in India. That's a very common thing where you have a short composition and then the musicians in the Hindustani style will then elaborate or improvise on that, that melody. Um, so that's in some ways very faithful to what Sophia Padden heard. And then to kind of match the aesthetics of her and the European sense of what is correct in music, she added a bass line and some sense of harmony to that. So you see, you, you hear the bass line progressively um, kind of becoming more prominent and interweaving with the top melody. Um, that's a great example of taking an, uh, a tune from the Orient, from India, and kind of adapting it to European standards or aesthetics. Um, I'll play you two more examples. These are all also both um, transcriptions written by Sophia Plowden, again, in the, in the um, 1780s. And these are both modern interpretations of her transcriptions. So the first one I'll play for you is an example of uh, her transcriptions of a tune played on European like period instruments. And the second example I'll play for you is again a modern recreation using that same transcription, but played on Indian instruments to kind of maybe give you a sense of more of what she might have heard and how that process of transcription or translation um, how that maybe how it, how it happened or give you an example of kind of both but again these are both modern interpretations of her her transcriptions uh, so the first one is a uh, Plowden transcription of a Hindustani air on European instruments European period instruments <laughs> So here you heard the, again the sort of same thing where you have a melody that's repeated over and over and over, um, kind of set against a, a, a drone sort of sound. You heard a few slides in there where the musicians on the viol or viol de gamba would um, bend or slide those notes a little bit, maybe giving some sense of the different tonalities and intonation in Indian music. And here is again the modern recreation of maybe what she might have heard, something similar to what she might have heard while she was in India, you know, on, played on Indian instruments. So, you know, something, it's interesting to hear that att attempt at kind of recreation, although um, the second example what you're hearing is sitar and flute and a little bit of viol de gamba and actually what's called a gatam, which is a South Indian instrument, which she may or may not have heard in her time in the North. Um, but interesting nonetheless to see the process and the kind of extent that many early Europeans went to try and understand in music of the other, in this case, India. Um, and it wasn't always, it wasn't always done um, uh, without thought. It was not always done with maliciousness and, or malicious intent. Oftentimes it was a real genuine engagement and a long-term engagement with, with the culture. <laughs> 
So if you're interested in more of this type of uh, information, there's a great podcast out there about Sophia Plowden and her interactions with Kanum Jan in, 19, in 1780s India. And I put the link up there. It's a long link, but if you just search the courtesan and the memsab, Kanum Jan meets Sophia Plowden at the 18th century court of Lucknow. Uh, it's a really nice uh, podcast, about a 40 minute podcast about Sophia Plowden and the kind of process of her um, making these transcriptions and kind of of uh, her encountering a lot of different musicians and courtesans um, done by a really great scholar, um, Catherine Schofield. So um, yeah, I would really encourage you to look, look at this up and it's a um, very interesting uh, podcast. So we've talked a lot about a lot of different things in this lecture about music, uh, colonialism, exoticism and orientalism. So I want to recap some of the main points we have, and I have several recap slides here. But the first is that really beginning in the 1400s, European colonial expansion brought the West, brought Europe into contact with uh, the, the whole of what, you know the East. And I use these terms West and East and Orient. Um, they're not really, they're kind of, again, imagined terms, but um, that was the way some people viewed it back then. But the colonial expansion brought Europe into contact with other parts of the world in a really unprecedented and, and intimate way. And in during this process, European powers sought to impose order on what they saw as a disordered or timeless or irrational society, uh, which they were starting to rule and starting to set up kind of control over. And that part of that was by establishing a single chronology um, using the Gregorian calendar. And part of that was through other, other ways of imposing order. Um, it was interesting to note that taste, as shown by the consumption of European commercial goods, was a marker of civilization. And um, you were able to uh, kind of delineate different levels of civilization on that pyramid by uh, oftentimes by the kind of goods that people consumed, which is interesting if you think about the kind of nature of capitalism in Europe and the kind of uh, different economies that were going on in other parts of the world. And the idea that Turkish instruments or plot lines or musical codes of difference were all the rage with European composers and their um, operas and plays and, and novels written about the, the kind of Turkish or what, what, what Turkish is kind of the code for Oriental other, uh, um, but it was very popular in Europe during the 16-1700s. Also important to understand is the, the, the idea of the kind of savage, the primitive savage, whether or not they were considered noble or savage. Um, and this was really uh, a, a, at the center of the debate to understand humankind and, and the, how people fit on this perceived pyramid of civilization. So savages and barbers and being kind of the lowest level and uh, Europeans thought that they were kind of the, the pinnacle of civilization at the time. Um, and notions of the, the, the savage were also played into music and art uh, in a variety of ways, as we saw. I discussed Orientalism as um, as kind of formulated by Edward Said. Um, I discussed the kind of three ways that Oriental, he formulates Orientalism, and it's important to remember all three um, uh, and how they have they had huge rem I mean, at the time in the 17 1800s. Orientalism wasn't really acknowledged as such, but it's only Said kind of putting this concept, looking back through history and seeing that the kind of cumulative activity of the West adds up to what he calls Orientalism. But there's kind of three definitions of Orientalism, and there's one is as an academic discipline. There are Orientalists who studied the quote unquote Orient. Um, Orientalism is also a style of thought that posits essential differences between the imagined categories of the Orient and the Occident. So um, there are kind of essential immutable differences that are imagined and but hold sway over people's um, uh, thoughts. And the third way, third thing of a uh, third um, Orientalism is a way of a Western way of dominating the East by restructuring in terms of drawing, drawing borders, by ruling, by colonizing, etc. So these three ways of Orientalism, these three definitions of Orientalism are important to keep in mind as we we go forward and we look at further examples of how the West interacts with um, the East. Um, 
Orientalism, uh, that thought process, ascribes many essentialist traits to the Orient and its people, traits that in a way negatively define the West, not negatively in terms of bad, but in terms of the West is not these traits. And remember we had traits like um, the femininity and sexuality, mystery, timelessness. These are all things that the Europeans kind of uh, threw together as kind of a definition of what the Orient or the East was. And by definition, the West was not those things. So they were negatively defining their own identity. Um, another recap is that, that Orientalism influenced all art forms purportedly de de depicting the East. So novels, painting, music, all the art forms during the 16, 17, 1800s were really, um, uh, if they were dealing with any sort of conception of the East, it was often through the lens, the, the artists or the composers often uh, viewed the East through the lens of Orientalism. It was almost inescapable that you couldn't, uh, it was extraordinarily rare for any European to have, um, uh, to, to be able to kind of escape that Orientalist way of seeing the East. Um, the Orient is routinely depicted as sexual, feminine, irrational, ineffective, yet dangerous, and timeless. That, and again, that timelessness kind of a, a, has a relationship to the complexity or the difficulty that Europeans had in, ter in terms of understanding the rhythmic aspects of uh, music from the Arab world, music from India, music from China, and other places. Um, musicologists encountering music from the East or the Orient had like I said, an especially difficult time fitting these quote unquote oriental rhythms into Western norms. And we're very disturbed in many ways by the lack of harmony. And so this went back from people, scholars studying um, the East from the 15, 1600s on through the lack of harmony that we you find in Western music was uh, disturbing and it made um, these scholars and, and travelers, etc., cetera, um, really kind of, re they were repelled by the music in some senses. Although there were um, certainly efforts to understand the Orient that were taken, um, they were undertaken with, without um, ill will. They were taking uh, efforts by Europeans to understand the Orient were taken uh, really kind of genuinely. And it was, it was not an attempt to um, demean it, but it was, there, were, there were many instances of genuine attempts at understanding. So that's all for this lecture. Thanks for uh, sticking with, him, with me. Like I mentioned before, we'll have another lecture revisiting Orientalism in more contemporary settings. Um, I just want to remind you that um, next week we'll have a quiz. I'll open it up on Wednesday and you'll have like you had until Friday to, to, um, to complete it. And also to remind you that it's uh, only a couple weeks now until you need to have my approval for your um, final project topic. And so if you have forgotten about that, please revisit the syllabus and look at the, your final project and the three components you need to have completed to receive a grade for that final project. Um, if you have any questions about that, please email me or post um, uh, a message on Canvas for me. Um, but otherwise, um, I'll see you uh, next week. Thanks.